This week, we are calling, interviewing Scott Perelman, who's on the coaching staff at the University of Florida, the recent national champions, NCAA men's team champions. Podcast number 41. Yes. This is going to be fantastic. Scotty, the Pearl, Coach P, lots <laughs> of fun. I've known Scott forever. Uh, during the NCAAs, fortunes ago, round of 16, quarters, mm -hmm. semis, finals, and getting phone calls. The stadium was so loud, it wasn't returning phone calls. So Francisco Montana, former world-class player, mm. uh, he's going to bring his son up to maybe it's his forehand or his backhand. But yeah. So he returned the call, and I apologized for um, not calling back sooner. And I told him that I was in the stadium. Mm -hmm. And right away he said, did Florida win? Did Florida win? Yeah. And, you know, everything brings back a memory. He had played doubles with the head coach of Florida, uh, Brian Shelton, back, yeah. back when they were two in pros. So then I said to Francisco, I said, do you know Scott Perelman? Is, when you ask someone that, I mean, they just get a smile on their face. Uh, actually, his brother Pablo had played for Scott when Scott was at Tennessee. It doesn't come off as an introvert to me. No, no, the Pearl. <laughs> I can remember how we met is we were on the staff at the Vic Braden Tennis College and he was, he was working summers. Mm. He was during the school year, he was working on his education and he was starting his college coaching career after he played, played at Ball State. In Cota de Casa, in right? Yeah, in Cal yeah. California, yeah. from the same hometown, Monroe, Michigan, is Vic Braden. Yeah, that's cool. And everybody's telling me, I was going to love this guy, that he's coming for the summer. Um, I learned so much from hanging out with a Pearl. He walks around and just so much energy upbeat, positive, and he just tells everyone, as soon as he greets him in the morning, it's a new day. It's a new opportunity to, to excel. So, yeah. But yeah, let's get him on the phone. It'd be fun. Sounds good. Just give me a second here to figure out your... You guys will have an instant connection because of your Braden background. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Ring number one. How are we doing? The Pearl. Scott, welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast. <laughs> it's a new day, Pearl. New opportunity to excel. So that, that a new day, a new opportunity. That comes you never from forget you. that. Is that your original line? It was I went with it's a new day, it's a new opportunity to succeed succeed, excel, succeed. Yeah. It's all the same thing. Yeah. yeah we hear that often around these parts. Pearl, uh, so exciting to watch your uh, team, the University of Florida win. It was like a movie script, especially yeah. with uh, Ben Shelton uh, closing out the match, father, son. That was cool. With, uh, but let's go, uh, go fast with your background. Monroe, Michigan, home of Vic Braden. Tell us a little bit about you in the 60s and 70s uh, with your tennis, getting started. Brother Brett, the mean guy, John Passion. Paul Showers, Bob Showers. I met so many guys from Monroe. Actually, David Weiss was a guy that we trained at one time, was a pro at the YMCA there. But tell us your start in Monroe, Michigan. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, my dad had played uh, uh, college tennis and basketball uh, at Trenton State Teachers College in New Jersey. And so uh, he got, my brother and I started in basketball and tennis at a fairly early age. and. It wasn't crazy like it is now, like five or six years old. It was more like 10 or 11 years old. And there was a coach in Monroe by the name of uh, Lawrence Alto, who also was a counselor at the high school. And my dad was the principal at the high school, so they knew each other quite well. And uh, he started us, and he built a tremendous uh, legacy of tennis in a little town like Monroe. And... Uh, so I got started in a public parks program. Uh, I never had a private lesson until I was probably 16 or 17. Uh, and it was just going out to the park every night at 5.30. And we hit a lot off the backboard. Uh, you often had to hit 50 forehands and 50 backhands before you could actually practice. And uh, Mr. Alto, Coach Alto, did a phenomenal job of getting lots of young kids involved in tennis and as you know from all your experiences you know kids feed off of each other and so 
we were we not only practiced and he would send us out to tournaments and uh, uh so it was a pretty low key start to tennis but Mr. Alto had passion for the game and and he instilled that passion in all of us and so uh <clears throat> we had unbelievable my uh, uh the high school teams I played on uh out of eight or nine guys six or seven went on to play division 1 tennis so it was a, a pretty competitive environment, but uh, a lot of fun and uh, uh, grew. <laughs> the place where I played as a kid was right behind, it was called Navarre Field, is right behind the house where Vic Braden grew up. And mm-hmm. that's where Vic got his start. He came out one day and was watching Mr. Alto teaching kids. And Mr. Alto called him over and said, Vic, you want to, you know, he didn't know his name, obviously. Do you want to hit a few balls? And he said yes. And that's how <clears throat> things got started for Vic years and years ago. So uh, it's been a great run for me. I, I mean, that, that passion, that love for the game is, is still there. And it was, uh, like I said, instilled at a young age. I was in Monroe, Michigan one time. I was helping Vic with a tennis teacher's workshop in Detroit. And obviously, Monroe, how far is it away from Detroit? It's pretty close. Yeah, 30 minutes or so, 35 minutes. Yeah, so uh, one of Vic's sisters uh, was in the hospital, and it was one of those weekends where Vic spoke, you know, like maybe three times over three days, and, and I was just there helping him out. But So we got in the car, and we drove to Monroe, and as soon as we got you know, right by where the tennis courts were, the, I guess the tennis courts are no longer there, but you'd have to tell me that, but... Anyway, I pull my car over and Vic Braden, the legend that I'm in Monroe, Michigan, we get out of the car and he goes, this is where it's all, all started. <laughs> uh, and he tells a story where he was, you know, saw some straight tennis balls and he was putting the balls in his pocket. I'd like to have some of those. And, this, <laughs> and Mr. Alto said, uh, hey, kid, because you're, 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 you're stealing the tennis balls, I'll give you a choice. You can either go to jail or you come over here and we'll, we'll teach you how to play tennis. That's the story. That's yeah. exactly correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the uh, that's it. that's the story precisely, and you know, uh, the 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 tradition and the success of uh, you know tennis in in, in the juniors uh, goes right back to Mr. Alto, and then his son, it was Larry Alto Jr. then took over the program, and he also was a big influence on me because, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, at that point. Uh, he had become a very good player, and he also had the passion uh, for the game and, and to teach it. And then <clears throat> at 16, I was running the city program. It was my first job ever, summer job. And uh, so then I started teaching, and that was actually the beginning for me as far as teaching tennis was concerned. Mm-hmm. And so now I'll be 66 in September, so been at it for 50 years. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. With you went to Ball State. Some of our young listeners might not know David Letterman, talk show host. I always tell people that they got the wrong guy. They needed to have uh, <laughs> Scott Perelman running the, running the talk show. Yeah. With uh, yeah, Ball State was uh, yeah that was an- another very important part of my development. Uh, <clears throat> I was really all set to go to Western Michigan, and uh, the coach that they had recruited me. Uh, uh, left uh, before I was uh, before I got there, and they didn't seem to move very fast to hire a coach. In the end, they hired a very good coach, but I didn't know that. And it was already in August. Uh, uh, I had my dorm assignment, my class was all set at Western, and I went down and visited Ball State. And I remember, my parents were in the airport going to Europe, and I called my mom and dad and said, "I changed my mind. I'm going to go to Ball State." And it was, uh, I was Billy Richards' first recruiting class, and uh, he's still coaching now. <laughs> yes. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, he's turned out to be a, a legend in the in the college coaching profession and uh, winning his coach in the history of the Mid-American Conference ever. And mm. just a wonderful guy, his wife, Sue, and, and, and his kids, Robbie and Christy, uh, uh, just helped. 
developed me as a person and, and uh, at, at a younger age. And he was a lot like my dad, very honest guy, very upfront, very direct, hardworking. Uh, uh, so uh, I was very, very fortunate. And, and I mean, to this day, uh, Billy Richards and I are close and, and still provides guidance and counseling and advice uh, to me and a guy I, I respect tremendously and very proud to be part of his coaching tree. And after, after, uh, after we won uh, 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 Saturday night, I reached out to him yesterday morning and we had a, we had a great conversation. So uh, again, just fortunate to go there and, uh, uh, and be able to be a part of the foundation of that program. We didn't win any championships when I was there, but then I, after I went and worked with Vic, I came back as his assistant, and uh, geez, I he strung together twenty or twenty five championships in a row at one point. And so, uh, Ball State really has a rich tennis tradition. And when we put when we, he has a reunion. I mean, we're putting 100, 110, or 15 guys in a room now. Mm. And uh, the stories, the laugh, the family atmosphere, just pretty special. Yeah, it'll be fun. Knowing that we're going to talk this morning, I uh, read an article about Bill Richards. Uh, 49 years. Uh, this, this past yeah. year is 49th year. So he's really maybe just like five years older than you, right? He's he, five or six years older than me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the article yeah. said... Yeah, he was 24... He was 24. It was his first, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it was his first coaching job and it's been his only coaching job, which has been amazing because he's had chances to leave, to go to the Big Ten and other places. And mm. he's decided to, to stay at Ball State. And like I said, I mean, he's made an impact at, in the town of Muncie, in the Ball State community. I mean, he's received the Presidential Medal uh, um, and like I said, I mean, he's the winningest coach ever in the history of the Mid-American Conference, which, mm -hmm. I mean, when you're doing something for 49 years and had that much success, it's, it's pretty good stuff. So, uh, wonderful guy, uh, learned a lot from him. And then I, I think I was able to make an impact coming back after I had worked with Vic just from the, the fundamental standpoint and the teaching of the game standpoint, uh, strategy standpoint, and, and things like that, that that I I think helped, uh, and he says it's not me, helped, turn, helped the turn, program turn the corner as they started to win championship after championship after championship. So, uh, again, I was very fortunate to be part of his re first recruiting class. Did you go straight to Vic to work with Vic after you graduated? Was I was supposed to go. I Bill Richards had been a graduate assistant at Bowling Green State University, and I was supposed to go there to be a graduate assistant and get mm -hmm. my master's. Mm -hmm. Everything was all set. I was coming into work in, uh, 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 in, in late spring, and a couple of the football uh, guys that I knew said they had gotten the notice that they had been accepted for assistantships at Bowling Green and the notice didn't come for me and I couldn't understand it and finally started to do some research and it turned out that when they had the meeting to give out the graduate assistantships, my name was not even on the table because my transcript had not been forwarded. Hmm. And I went down to the office and, and had documentation that it had gone out in the mail and for some reason they never received it and so that thing fell through. It was, it was meant uh, to be, probably. It was meant to be. And after that, I'll never forget the morning. Vic called me. Uh, uh, I was teaching at a club up outside of Detroit. And basically, he said, if it, if you're the person that it seems you are and you wanted to come out here and train, mm. we'll see what happens. And so uh, I ended up getting in the car and just driving out there not knowing whether I would be hired or not hired. Uh, hmm. uh, Tom Warfel, who, who Steve knows well, uh, played at Ball State, and he was working with Vic. And uh, he was living in a lady's house, uh, had a room, and I slept on the floor next to him for the first month 
and he drove me up to to Tribuco Canyon, the big place, every morning, and mm-hmm. I did my training. And, and Steve will tell you, you know, you don't until a position opens, you don't know <laughs> that you're going to get hired. So I'm out there just going in there training every day, not knowing whether it could be a week, a month, three months, or six months. And uh, another little interesting story about Vic when I first got there because. <clears throat> Like I said, my dad was the principal at the high school, and the athletic director's name was Red Davis. And uh, Steve might remember this story from Vic, but Vic had a very, very bad experience uh, at at Monroe High School uh, because he played in a pickup basketball game and uh, and through the rules, through some things, and 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 with because of Red Davis, he lost his eligibility in basketball his I think his senior year mm-hmm. and this red guy Red Davis was their friends with my dad and he had sent a recommendation for me and when I got out there and actually Dick and I spent time together and started to talk about Monroe he absolutely despised Red Davis mm-hmm. and and Vic really in a lot of ways did not have pleasant memories of Monroe because of what happened with this eligibility thing and like only Vic could, he said to me, you know, I didn't want that to affect an opportunity that you might have with me. Uh, but mm-hmm. as it turns out, the guy that I thought that really made a difference uh, uh, from a recommendation <laughs> standpoint was probably not the right guy. I had to send the letter, but uh, <laughs> but it was a connection. Monroe was a connection for Vic and I that 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 uh, that allowed us to become close, and uh, he treated me probably a lot better than I deserved to be treated at the time. And I mean, the man has been a huge influence on not only Steve, but myself and uh, uh, just, you know, to be able to teach the game, you've got to really understand the fundamentals. I think any good coach will tell you that about any sport. Yeah. And Vic laid the foundation for guys like Steve and I, and, and we became lieutenants. And we've stuck with it for all these years. And, and it's just a love for the game, a desire to grow the game, a desire to teach the game in the right way, a desire to help kids, help parents understand their role in the, in the whole thing. And we've gone in different directions, but uh, uh, Steve has made a phenomenal contribution to the game of tennis. And in my opinion, fundamentally, is as good as anybody, not only in, in the United States, but in the world, as far as helping kids get started the right way, with the right grips, with the right ideas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the fact that after all these years, he and I still speak and are close <laughs> is, uh, is very special to me. Yeah. Now we always say they're fundamentals that stand the test of time. You know, these days, everybody's trying to reinvent the wheel, and uh, especially on the forehand. But um, yeah, the physical laws and the dimensions of the court haven't changed, and Vic did so much research, and and uh, yeah, it's just nice to have all that foundation. Yeah, Parola, uh, thanks for the plug. I'll, I'll I'll get you that pizza. I promise. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> with Braden, he loved basketball too, mm. and he used to say about basketball. What, he, what he used to say about yeah. basketball was. Um, you know, even if you just want to go out and shoot in the driveway, it doesn't matter. If they say the same thing with tennis, you don't have to play matches. You don't have to play in a tournament. Just go out and hit the ball, get some exercise. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Vic wasn't very tall. And uh, Artis Gilmore was there. I remember giving Artis Gilmore a lesson. because Vic was with Wilson. And Vic's thing was just trying to uh, raise money for research and improve all sports, not just tennis, the instruction. So it was really strange. This guy is like seven feet tall. And, you know, Braden information, you got to be on a ladder to get down. It's got to be 14'6". I remember telling Artis Gilmar, I was giving him a VIP lesson. Yeah, he was like seven foot two. And I said, well, you're too short to hit down. And he looked at me and said, no one has ever told me in my life <laughs> yeah. that I'm too short. <laughs> but um, in Vic's library, which now the Tennis Channel has, um, you would remember this, where Vic was dunking basketballs. Artis Gilmore would dunk a basketball, and then you see Vic Braden dunking a basketball. Then the camera zooms out, and they brought a trampoline, and, and Vic was on a trampoline. Jumping. <laughs> <laughs> basketballs. I mean, Pearl, you have a great sense of humor. I used to think Monroe, Michigan, uh, something must be in the water because Vic 
like yourself, I used to say that you guys uh, both could have been professional comedians. Uh, for sure. Yeah, well, it's really the, the thing that a lot of people probably don't know. And back in those days, uh, we, we, were, we were all calling you the king of sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I can re- well, I spent a lot of time in the locker room. About, I can remember you telling me. I mean, the listeners should know I go so so far back with Pearl that you were shaving before I was. And I used to shower. Uh, you know, I used to shave and then shower. And you t- remember you telling me I had it backwards. I needed to shower, yeah. <laughs> shower first and then shave. But with, um, no, the, the, the kid. Got to soften the hairs up, you know, but now you don't have any hair, so. Yeah, yeah. Pearl's yeah, and, Pearl's and I don't have much it. either, yeah. So, yeah, things have changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you remember you telling me one time, because, you know, at that time, Vic had left coaching juniors at the Kramer Club. And the reason he got into the adult business is he wanted to raise more money for research, for trying to improve tennis teaching. Mm. But I can remember you telling me, uh, uh, Smitty, 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 I don't think you're serious enough to coach juniors. Because really, when we were coaching adults, it wasn't like, okay, we're getting these adults ready for a tournament. You know, teaching toads. With, uh, but now we have people fill out a goal sheet and they, they often make the mistake, they write down, you know, <laughs> I want to play college tennis. I want to, you know, I want to be... Ranked, ranked high world. nationally. You know, yeah. I want to win more Grand Slams than Serena. Yeah. <laughs> so then I go, okay, let's go to work. Once they write that down, uh, yeah, so many things. With uh, so, um, the darting mongoose. You tell us you could. We we'll go on to some more things here. But Vic, um, tell us about being the darting mongoose. Yeah, well, it, if you worked for Vic back in those days, it was. It was pretty. It was something pretty special from the standpoint that, you know, he was doing a lot of TV commentary at the time, and uh, the tennis college was kind of a place to be. It was the hub of what was going on with, as you said, a lot of research, and we had a lot of celebrities coming in and out of, <clears throat> in and out, out of out of the camp. Uh, but so he was doing a film about tennis etiquette. And I had this huge afro mustache. <laughs> and uh, so he put me at the net one day on my knee. And in the middle of the point, I went sprinting across the court. And he referred to me as the darting mongoose. And <laughs> it, was, uh, it was the first time I'd ever been in a film and first time I'd ever done anything like that. And as you know, Smitty, from being on the staff, it stuck. I mean, they, people were calling me the darting mongoose for years. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, t- uh, the title of the film was Teaching Tennis Etiquette. So, yeah, when yeah. people don't know tennis, there's a rally going on in the next court. And so you would just abruptly run right into <laughs> the middle of the rally to get your tennis ball. But yeah. he, he had you with your shirt off and he had That's you awesome. smoking a cigar. And it was just. <laughs> just... We got to find those videos. The darting. Yeah, mongoose. I've got it somewhere. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some research here oh, yeah, uh, soon, yeah. and I'll, I'll sure pull that out yeah. and, and send you guys a copy. Yeah, yeah that would be amazing. Pretty funny. Yeah. With, um, so you left uh, Ball State and you went to Kansas, and I ended up going from Vic's place to uh, Tyler Junior College to start a tennis teaching program. You know, then many connections we had through that was, uh, I mean, you sent your brother to us, but uh, so many things. And then you you got your camp built up to three, 400 students, campers, you hire people from our program. Um, but I can say more about that, but talk about going to the archives. You used to come down, I think you came a couple times, maybe it was just, just two, not three, and you ran a weekend on team coaching. And I never forget one of the, one of your brother's friends said, uh, Coach Perum and, uh, could you tell us, tell us a few stories? And uh, you said, uh, Smitty, why don't you shut the door? <laughs> and anyway, I wish I had this on videotape, but I do have it on audio tape. Uh, it'd be good to go back and just, the, the principles would still be the same. What you're doing at the University of Florida with your fellow coaches, the principles would still be the same. It's all about character to build culture. Um, I was going to ask you, Scott, just quickly. I mean, did you know you wanted to be a coach right away coming out of, college or you know as a player did you know okay someday i want to i want to coach yeah i i I actually did uh uh, it was always a passion uh for me and i i thought initially that i would be at the at the high school level 
kind of like my where mm. I saw my mom and dad that I I would teach math or physical education and and mm. and then coach a, a high school team and um, then that I never really went in that direction uh, as far as teaching at the high school level uh, and it became apparent at least at that time uh, it. It seemed like if you wanted to be a college coach, you had to have a master's degree because mm. back then, different than now, a lot of college coaches were teaching classes. Mm. Uh, and you had to have a class load to be able to, as part of the job. And mm. so I got my master's in physical education at Ball State. And I actually got halfway through my MBA. Uh, and then I stopped. And for the longest time, it was probably one of the few things that I've ever that I've not finished ever in my life that I started <laughs> mm. because uh, that was one of the things that was big in our family. If you start something, you're going to finish it. You know, you don't quit in the middle of anything. Uh, you know, my dad would never talk to a coach on my behalf. <laughs> you know, son, mm. if you have a problem, you go see the coach yourself. Mm. Uh, so some of those things that, that, that are just, my dad was an outstanding people person. I, I mean, he he instilled some other things in me that stick to this day. Mm. Uh, the person sitting in front of you is the most important person in the world at that moment. Do not take a phone call. Do not look the other way. Look him in the eye. Mm. You have two ears and one mouth. <laughs> you know, listen twice as much as you talk. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, don't talk about yourself. <laughs> Find out more about the person you're with than than and spending time just telling them all about your, your, yourself. And so uh, a lot of those things uh, I was very fortunate to have instilled in me at, at, at a very young age. Mm. And, uh, you know, those things have, have, have been, have helped me through, through all these years. And, and, you know, <clears throat> relationship to me is what is so important. Uh, um, I've spent a lot of time staying in touch with a lot of people that I've known over, over the years because, uh, and that's what keeps me in the game even to this day. I mean, to be surrounded by these young kids uh, keeps me young. And, uh, you know, one of the ladies here in town whose son was our manager, <clears throat> we became close and she says to me, <clears throat> Scott, you know why these guys like you so much? I said, no, Kathy, tell me. Because you act just like them. <laughs> 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 so you know, after all these years, to be able to to, to still relate to and watch uh, young kids eighteen to twenty two or twenty three grow for me is 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 an absolute joy, and that's the age range for me where I feel like I I've been able to make the most impact, and for me, have the most enjoyable kind of that final stage of of. Uh, of a boy turning into a young man and uh, just philosophically helping them uh, set the right course from the, for themselves as far as uh, direction and uh, what they want to grow to be and, you know, how you treat people and your integrity and mm -hmm. how important honesty is and things of that nature. So, um, been a fun ride. I, I, I have a wonderful relationship with each and every one of our ten kids on this team, and and uh, it's something that that I enjoy uh, not only the relationship and following them as they as they grow into men, and um, you know, watching young people become productive members of society is uh, is an absolute thrill for me, and uh, so it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's been a fun ride for sure. Pearl, let's uh, back up with uh, your parents must have been men for each other. Leo and Leona. When your brother was a student <laughs> of mine, it was a long time, time ago, there was no phones. He used to come to my place on Sunday morning, every Sunday morning early and ask if he could use the phone. And then that's where I knew your parents were Leo and Leona. <laughs> so they were meant for each other. Tell us a couple of yeah, things about Leo and Leona. Leona met at yeah, Leo and Leona met at at, uh, at Trenton State Teachers College. Both grew up in New Jersey. My mom was from Manasquan, New Jersey. My dad from Perth Amboy, New Jersey. 
My mom was a cheerleader. My dad played basketball and tennis, as I, as I said. And uh, and then as they graduate, uh, uh, they graduate college, 19, early 19, mid 1950s, they answer an ad in the New York Times for two school teachers to come to Monroe, Michigan. <laughs> And they they both got the job, moved to Monroe, Michigan, and spent their whole uh, lives, the rest of their lives there, and and were in education. Uh, my mom taught school the whole time, and my dad started off as a math teacher, became a, an assistant principal, and then a principal, and then assistant principal at the high school, and then got into administration uh, there. Uh, assistant superintendent. So uh, they both uh, were lifetime educators. And that also is, is in my blood. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the joy of teaching, <laughs> the joy of learning. Uh, uh, they both traveled a lot and uh, big, big influences uh, on, on me. It's interesting because <clears throat> my, uh, my mom uh, and dad wanted to have children. My mom was having a very difficult time getting pregnant, and they had decided that they were going to adopt. And all of a sudden, my mom got pregnant with me, had my brother almost one year later to the day, uh, miscarried a set of twins, and then had my two younger sisters. And uh, so... When I was born, they were ecstatic. <laughs> and I mean, they doted on me and, uh, like you couldn't believe. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, as, as Smitty will tell you, you know, uh, I never grew to be very tall. And my mom always used to say, uh, big things come in small packages. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of her favorite lines and you, you know you, you know a diamond ring comes in a small package uh, uh, all these things that come in a small package she would shoot out and and uh, so uh, uh they, they, my mom and dad were wonderful they were a huge influence and as i grew older and went to college i just realized how fortunate i was to have grown up with two people that were loving and caring and you know, you obviously, as you both know, you know, as you hear other people's stories about all kinds of crazy stuff that went on when they were younger, whether it be mental or physical abuse or that type of things. And there was, you know, we saw none of that. We just saw two loving parents. And so the example was 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 very, very good for me early on. Pearl, to go uh, back to Vic Braden, you guys, so many things. Uh, Monroe, Michigan, sense of humor, just how you can just light up the fire, bring the spark to the room. So my son, Mikhail, who um, you, you helped me with Mikhail. He had a, a, you know, a very successful career in tens and twelves. He was one of the best players easily in, in the country. And then next thing you know, I, the, uh, his younger brother is three or four inches taller. And I mean, he just did everything he was told that you know, he's, he, so he, he was mad at the world for a little bit. So Vic Braden, he was my son. Both sons are so fortunate to work on the tennis court numerous times with Vic on a, a regular basis because I was in Tampa for 15 years. And at one time Vic had Vic Braden Tennis College in Orlando. And every time he came, our whole crew would come up. So um, Mikhail meets with Vic. And I had no idea what Mikhail was going to say. So it's the three of us. I remember it was an IHOP. It rained. <laughs> It was a rainy day, so it's like, okay, the tennis program was postponed for like four hours. Like, okay, we got some time to talk. So Vic, licensed psychologist and just the master with, with children, says to Mikhail, Mikhail, what's your problem? What's bothering you? I had no idea what he was going to say, and he goes, I'm short. <laughs> and Vic just uh -huh. looked at him and goes, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm in, yeah. With, uh, back, back to your mom. What did she teach? What subject? She taught English. Yeah, she taught English. My dad taught math. Uh, uh, so my mom and, and dad were both sticklers for 
you know, uh, the English language and that you, you speak and write uh, properly, correctly. Uh, so again, uh, something, something very positive that was instilled in, in all, all four of us at, at, at a young age. So, uh, yeah, going to, going to school, doing well, getting a college degree, ideally going on to get a postgraduate degree. Those are things were all, all encouraged in my family. So, like I said, very, very fortunate, very lucky to have Leo and Leona uh, in my corner. And, uh, you know, one of the, <clears throat> my dad died in 1986 at the age of 66 from, from colon cancer. And mm. I mean, he used to have this line, uh, you know, I haven't missed work in 35 years and I haven't been to the doctor in 40. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a badge of courage until, you know, in his late fifties, he suddenly things weren't going right he goes to the doctor and finds out he has cancer mm. and um things slowly went downhill from there so died way way too early uh 1986 and actually in that year he passed and my, one of my best friends in high school got in a car accident and passed in that same year so he mm. never was able to you know it was 87 and 88 when we won our first two uh big eight championships at at, at kansas and he was never able to witness any of that, which is something that uh, I know he would have loved. And I, I mean, and even what happened Saturday night, had he been able to be there, he would be in, absolutely in hog heaven to watch something like that. So a uh, little remiss that, that, that never, that he and I never had that experience together, but it was a um, very, very supportive man of everything I tried to do. And so, he was a big, big influence in my life, for sure. I'm sure he was looking down on you. Yeah. Yeah. I, fe I felt it. Uncle yeah. Vic, too. Uncle Vic Braden. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people looking down. I, it's very fortunate. Yeah. Coming back to English, uh, so you would come and speak to our students, and they're getting a two-year degree, uh, recreation, tennis, teaching, pro management. But I can remember uh, you being asked. I have total recall. I recall totally what I want to. And one of <laughs> the students would ask, what should they study when they left the two-year program? And I remember you saying, study the English language. The key is communication. Yeah. Mm. I remember yeah. that. Pearl, tell us, take us to well, Kansas. Oh, go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, communication is the key to everything in the end. I mean, that's what's so different now about the young people, you know, with this phone and everything. You, you know, you don't. It, it, the communication still. I mean, we have one son, Sammy. Tried to do, uh, uh, um, tried to do the best job I possibly could as, with him as a youngster and teaching him how to communicate with people. It's a lost art nowadays. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's not sending a text message. <laughs> it's it's actually communicating, looking people in the eye, <laughs> so talking from, to them, from, from a writing standpoint, uh, uh, children today they don't know what a letterhead is. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have the, you know, you have Grammarly and you have spell check and all those things that make it easy just to have them do the work for you. You know, you can yeah. be lazy with it yeah. instead of, hey, I got to look this word up and figure out how to spell it. You just, your phone does it, you know, or your computer. No, I used to do things, yeah. Pearl, you know, I'd say, okay, tomorrow I want everybody to bring in a quote from Winston Churchill. That meant they had to go to, if they were fortunate enough where their parents had a set of encyclopedias or they had to go to the library. Now they just push a few buttons and they they yell out the quote from the back of the van. It's just not the same. It's too easy. It's too fast. But Scott, I think a lot of, you know, people accuse us oftentimes as, oh, you know, old school or whatever, old school fundamentals. But it's the same thing with those life skills. I mean, you know, when a kid shows up here, that's one of the things we notice right away is maybe how, how they handle themselves, their body language. If they have a firm handshake, do they, you know, enunciate? Do they, you know, do they make the eye contact, those types of things? Yeah. Because really... You can look out, you know, watching the NCAAs, you can kind of see the kids that have had, you know, some of that old school kind of life, you know, the life lessons where they, just the way they handle themselves. Yeah, you know, so, so with, uh, you know, back, Scott and I are exactly the same age. So if, you know, my friends were like myself. That, older? Moving towards 70. But, you know, <laughs> I'm just teasing guys. Come our, on. Our parents, I mean, we're from the age where you could climb trees and, fall off your bicycle and no one, no one was there to 
pick you back up. Yeah. But, you, you know, you would say, hi, Mr. Perelman. Hi, Mrs. Perelman. How are you today? Um, hi, Mr. Smith. Hi, Mrs. Smith. That doesn't really happen today. Kids don't really greet adults. Yeah. So it's amazing. Or it's, maybe it's like, what's not, up? It's not taught. It's not enforced. Sup? Well, it has to do with respect. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're taught respect at a very young age. You respect your elders. You know, I remember <clears throat> my parents saying uh, uh, kids are meant to be seen but not heard. <laughs> you know, you, you don't you don't interrupt adults while they're speaking. Uh, you know, just little things like that is just and <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Coach Felt will tell you. I mean, in the recruiting process, we are very conscientious of watching how a player interacts with his parents, <laughs> and it, it's not in an appropriate manner. We will often back away from a kid immediately. Because that sends a red flag goes up uh, for all three of us as a coach. And if there's not respect, if there's not communication, if there is not due diligence in that area, we'll move on to another kid that has that. And, and <clears throat> that helps determine the character of your team overall. <laughs> and, and it ends up being a, an important, a very important piece trying to build the right culture in, in uh in in trying to develop a program in my opinion yeah that, that goes way back to bear bryant where you know he used to say i'm recruiting the parents i've got to get in the living room i gotta see what the parents are like i was just going to say if there's any juniors out there listening or or parents with juniors you should have them repeat that last two minutes we yeah so and, and, go ahead yeah so 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 important and I, I mean you know <clears throat> you know as, as a parent you want to do everything for your kid to have it a little better than what you have it and <clears throat> you know through all those young years who's taking care of you <laughs> you know what I mean and if yeah. you don't have a sense of respect for that I mean that's that's not good <laughs> that's just uh, that's just the bottom line and in, in my opinion and so uh, and kids nowadays I mean you you know you go to tournaments you see a lot of of negative behavior from kids and mm. and it doesn't go over big with us as college coaches to be honest with you yeah. you know we're that that's a that's a red flag for sure so nice. as a parent uh, raising a kid I, I always say we all have our own role you know uh, I would tell a parent you know you didn't need to be mom and dad you know, let me be the coach. Mm. <laughs> let me handle everything on the court, fundamentally, all that stuff. You uh, need to be there as a as, to be supportive. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me that whether you won or lost. You're welcome home at any time. <laughs> uh, just yeah. that, That's not your role, in my opinion, as a parent, to chastise your kid about winning or losing. Uh, your role is is like I said, be supportive, be caring, and make sure that the behavior is appropriate. You know, uh, uh, you know, my dad, and my mom, and no one, my coach, no one's putting up for you turning around, chucking the racket into the fence. That's mm. not acceptable. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, uh, you cussing out a referee, not acceptable. You know, treat the game with respect. Treat your opponent with respect. That's all fundamentally part of what this game is all about and and again young people that don't understand that if you're talking about wanting to go on and play college tennis that's not a good look yeah. <laughs> you know someone that that handles themselves uh, uh uh like uh professionally on the court and and how they treat everybody around them you know in in the recruiting process you want your kid to get the best opportunity possible he needs to be able to put his best foot forward day after day after day. And it has nothing, nothing to do with winning or losing. <laughs> you know, as Steve will tell you, the two great imposters, <laughs> winning and losing. Yep. You know, are you able to handle that? Them both with the same, with the same, same dignity and class. And, you know, that's a big thing for Coach Shelton and our program here is, is how do you handle yourself? You know, we, we we want to be the team, win or lose. We're shaking everybody's hand after the match. We're congratulating the opponent. Give them credit 
for what they have done. And I mean, we've had a, a, our fair share of success here, but we've had our fair share of failure here, especially in the early years. And so, uh, you know, and again, you're sending a message to young people. How do you deal with situations? How do you deal with stress? How do you deal with losing? And one of the things that's kind of been a watchword here for us is whether you win, whether you lose, we go back to work. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you win, you lose, you go back to work. And, yeah. and we don't win and just go have a party for a week and not practice and not do anything and pat ourselves on the back and tell yourself how good you are. Yeah. You win, you, you, you evaluate what happens and you, you move on and go back to work. You lose. And as, as both of you know, you can learn a lot more from losing many times than you can from winning. Yep. But you don't just just dispense the fact that you lost. You go back. You try to look at the tape. You try to evaluate things. What what things can I do to be better tomorrow than I was yesterday? And and then and then go back to work. <laughs> and and it's it. You want to just be able as a player, in my opinion, to be able to take small little steps every day. And if you're willing to do that and are able to do that over time, you end up taking big steps because each day you're doing something to make make yourself better. Yeah. Uh, so big, big thing, I think, for kids and parents. I remember when Kobe Bryant said the same thing where he just said, hey, win or lose, the process is the same. The next day you go back to work. Just a you little go back bit. to work. Yeah, and, get 1% yeah. better. And, oh, it's, like, it's like Cher Pova won a Grand Slam title and – She's going off to the press, and her father says, I'll see you tomorrow at 9.30 in the gym. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I mean, it's a life lesson. You know what I mean? What are you going to do in, in life when you got a job and, and, and either you have success or you have failure? I mean, you've got to go back to work. We, it's as a, <clears throat> as a coach, I've always believed that young people yearn for discipline. You have to provide it as a coach. You provide discipline, a young person will respect that o o o over time. But it, the discipline of being a worker, as both of you know, it doesn't take you long to evaluate a young person. Are they a worker or are they not a worker? <laughs> and kids that are workers are going places. They, they have a chance. They're going to give themselves a chance because people respect uh, young people that are that are willing to work, that know how to work, that are willing to put in a long day, and you know aren't worried about how much they're getting paid or how many weekends they had to work or how many nights they had to work. It's just you go and you work until the job is done, and then you get up tomorrow morning and do it again, yeah. and again, and again, and again. And that's one of the things that has led to our success at Florida is Coach Shelton. Uh, uh, Tanner Stump, our full-time assistant, myself. You got three guys that are workers. <laughs> we 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 may not be the best or the worst at what we do, but all three of us are going to get up every single day and go to work and work hard and stay as long as necessary uh, to to get the job done. And young people, I, I mean, and that's what we try to instill in young people. And I I think you, I think it's a difference maker. Yeah, I mean, the best example is just, or the best way to do it is just leading by example, right? I mean, and so I'm sure they see that, your hard work. That's, yeah, no Bro, question, super. lead by example. Bro, yeah. uh, just take a minute or two, uh, Kansas, a uh, minute or two is not, not enough, but coaching men and women, you're there, I think, 10 years and uh, built the program up. Uh, I know from, you also spent some time at Tennessee, where then after that you were on the tour with Chris Woodruff, but why don't you take those two things and say a few things about Kansas. Yeah, well, my days at Kansas were, 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 were very special to me. Uh, you know, I was 26 years old. I was a head coach, Division One school, uh, men's and women's tennis. I had both teams for the first five and a half years. Uh, and neither one of them had been, uh, neither one of the programs had been very successful. So, You've got to go in there and you've got to build a culture and you've got to change some things around. Uh, you know, when I first got there, uh, I tell 
<clears throat> a lot of stories, but you know, we would go to warm up at a at a tournament, and uh, my guys or gals would go to the back courts in the far corner to warm up. Are you kidding me? What are you guys doing? <laughs> oh, we don't want anybody to see us warming up. You're kidding me, right? <laughs> we're going to go to the front court, court one, stadium court, and we're taking those two courts to warm up. <laughs> you know, get, you walk into the facility. Pop your, your chest out, lift your head up, mm-hmm. and act like you own the place. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I mean, so the mentality wasn't right. And, you know, and and there was no culture. And so how do you build that from the base up? I mean, obviously, hard work. Uh, I mean, every single day I say it's a new day. It's a new opportunity to succeed. Uh, Got to be on time. Got to be a joke that it was CST coaches standard time. You needed to set your watch five or 10 minutes ahead. (laughs) And I mean, I was obsessed about things like that. You know, I used to lock the gate at, at, at when practice started, you weren't on time. You, you owed me an hour on the stairmaster and then you could come back the next day and practice, but you know, not showing up on time, not being ready to practice. Those things were unacceptable. So glad you said that. Uh, oh, sorry. Keep going. I thought you were. No, no go ahead. No, I was yeah. just saying. I'm so glad you said that. We we've got a player here, and we were heading over actually to the campus and uh, to hit with one of the, the players up at the high performance or the uh, player development there. And you know, I was waiting in the van, and he was six minutes late. <clears throat> and he got in the van, and I said, "Do you know what would happen if you were at Ohio State and you were six minutes late? You know, because this kid's going off to play college tennis." And and I said, "Everybody would be running lines." You know, and it's like, you know, it's not acceptable to be six minutes late. You know, we're trying to get up there and hit. And I just remember back in the day with Vic, we had a project going where we were interviewing different successful people um, with a young group of, of kids. They would interview the the successful people. Uh, Colin Powell, Chevy Chase was one of the people we interviewed. But and they all said one of the top things on their list was punctuality, just to not waste yeah. other people's time to always be on time. So glad you said that yeah punctuality is yeah. a communicator you gotta you yeah you you know what makes what what makes you think that that uh your time is not more valuable than my time and vice versa you know and again it's respect respect yeah and respect i i, I mean i i <clears throat> i you know see you know i grew up in the midwest i when i went out to work with vic uh on the west coast uh you know, I, I'm making friends uh, away from tennis and, you know, they'd say, hey, let's go to dinner uh, uh, at, at 7 o'clock. Or I'd show up at 645. I'd be there. Right. They'd come rolling, rolling in at 730, 745. Yeah, faster. And, right. you know, <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, what's going on? Hey, man, surf was up tonight. Surf was up, man. We're out on the porch, man. What do you want from us? You know, hey, be cool, man. It's all right. We're just 40 minutes late. Don't worry about it. And, I mean, I'm losing my mind. You know, as, as I'm sitting there for an hour waiting on, on people. So it's, it's, it's a very important dynamic and something that young people, in my opinion, and as parents, <laughs> you know, you need to keep teach your kids. There, again, when you're if you're talking about wanting your kid to go on to play college tennis, these are things that 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 college coaches are looking at. You know, you've got an appointment to to see somebody or for a match or for a practice, and you come rolling in five or ten minutes late. Not cool. Mm-hmm. That's not a cool thing to do. Obviously, in my opinion, so I can, uh, I can you've got it. I can remember a nice guy Pearl setting me up on a blind date, and I show up and I'm oh, late. Right. I, I'm I'm late, and Here we that go. next thing I know is the Pearls. It's me. What are you doing <laughs> showing up late? Yeah. He, he, so, uh, but like, yeah, it's amazing to think back that we were just in our twenties. It was so long ago. Steve but, always says. So anyway, know, getting back to Kansas, uh, yeah. uh, uh, it, it was uh, it was it was not easy. I, I mean, I was working a relentless amount of hours traveling with both teams uh uh you know you go on the road with one team and come back late sunday night driving back and forth to boulder colorado for the weekend and (laughs) have to be at practice the next morning uh we had a funny situation at kansas there were only four indoor courts in the whole town so 
one team had to practice from six to eight in the morning and the other team had to practice from 10 to 12 at night. And we do that all the way through the winter. And I would be at both practices every day. And, uh, you know, if I slept, you know, one to five <laughs> and get up and do both practices and had enough energy at that time to run three or four miles at noon. And mm-hmm. it was just go, 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 uh, nonstop type of thing. But slowly but surely, we, we recruited uh, better players, better people, and and we started to have some success, and ultimately won a couple of uh, of Big Eight championships, which was <clears throat> very very uh, important time in my life, just from the standpoint that you know you strive to be successful, you strive to want to win championships, but as a young coach, you never know. <laughs> whether it's actually going to happen and whether you're doing the right things. And then, you know, you get a little bit of validation when you finally see success, not only from the, from the kids, but for the program. And I used to always talk a lot about the program. It wasn't about me. It wasn't mm-hmm. about any, any single person. It was all about the program. It's what you're doing best for the program. I would often say, and still to this day, I know the program is good for you. Are you good for the program? <laughs> you know, exactly. are you at, are you adding value to what's going on here, or are you just taking advantage of what's put been being put in front of you? So, I, I think understanding, and it's always been true for me. I mean, I've had my share of different jobs and gone different places, and and stayed. <clears throat> shorter periods of time, sometimes longer periods of time. But I always wanted to leave the job knowing that I'd left the place a little bit better than it was when I came. Very, very important thing uh, to me personally. And I think a very important concept for young people to understand. You, you know, you're not just there. <laughs> yeah. you know, one thing make a contribution. Make a contribution. The program at Kansas uh... – Jennifer Roberts, who's married now to Jim Morgan, a teaching pro, she was with you for two years, and then uh, you sent her to Tyler, Texas, where she got a master's degree. But she, you know, lived in the dorm. Of course, you know, so you live in the dorm for free, the cafeteria for free, and then you, but you're you're studying to get your master's. But she's working the tennis tech program. You certainly prepared her well. She helped out so much. I mean, so little pay. Um, but yeah, the training that she got at Kansas was, and again, you think about that, that, that just took the program, our program up a level. And then the impact when the program gets better, everybody in the program gets better. The program's got to be bigger well, than the individual. It, yeah. Yeah. And Smitty, I, you know, looking back and I, I don't know, uh, you know, you and I haven't really discussed this, but I mean, I think those were some of your best days, <laughs> uh, 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 your years at, at, at Tyler, because you influenced, so many young people in in such a positive way to teach the game and grow the game, and you expose you you know that that uh, avenue that format uh, allows you to you know bring people in and, and and influence these young people in just such such a positive way. I mean, you were so so good at it at, 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 at through, through those years, so. Uh, yeah, that, those were, those were a lot of fun years. And I'm sure you look back with those, uh, with a lot of smiles on your face. Well, I appreciate the comment, um, about how the program impacted other people's lives. You know, in many ways, uh, I would look back and say, you know, I, I probably should have just stayed there. But, you know, there's always this and that where you, you move on. Um, you know, one of the things where I wanted to, uh, I wanted to have the tennis team, and you knew this, I wanted to have the tennis team be part of the tennis tech program. So Jennifer Roberts, we, we, at one point, the program it was small. I got to the point where we had over 100 students. So I was there for a, throughout the 80s, 10-year uh, period. And so the first coach, uh, Fred Niffen, he resigns. And then I recommended Jennifer Roberts to coach men and women. And she wasn't even interviewed. So then they brought in Robert Cox, who, you know, he went, eventually went to Arkansas yeah. for years. And they, so when he left and 
brought in John Peterson, not to say that they didn't bring in the right people, but so then I recommended Craig Tiley because he was, you know, the person doing so much administrative and on court, off court work. And he wasn't interviewed. Now he would have been one of the guys that was in the class taking notes when you, when you came and you know he went on and was very fortunate to follow in Jennifer's footsteps because she was the, um, um, she played at Illinois. You know, she was the captain of the team. That's where she was with me, two, you, two years with you, two years with me. Then she was a year with Braden. And I remember Carol Carr is talking to her because, you know, Jennifer looked like she was 16 and she was so positive. And I said, I remember just telling this athletic director, she worked for Scott Perelman at Kansas with two teams for two years. She's worked for me for two years. She will be able to work around the clock and, and get the job done. But you no. Know, so anyway, I, I promised myself when they didn't interview Jennifer and they came around again and they didn't interview the second person I recommended to be the team coach is I would just resign. So I think you have to have your principles and I really wanted to grow the program. I was the only full-time faculty member. When I started, I was told every 20 students, I would get another full-time faculty member. And I do look back at that with fond memories because it was students teaching students. I mean, yeah. I, I showed up and that was back in the heyday of the tennis boom where on a given day, I could be working with 300 people. So it could be a Tuesday where we had the dollar clinic at night with 80 people in it. We've got a hundred, hundred, uh, tennis teaching students and we had PE classes and we had our Guinea pigs and, you know, a couple, a couple of them went on to, uh, win an NCA, uh, individual title. Uh, let, let's just with that, uh, go to Chris Woodruff. I mean, he won an NCA title when you were working with him. And, why don't you tell us well, about that, that was experience? after, yeah, after my, uh, after my 10 years at Kansas, uh, um, you know, I've, I was always driven from the day I started to, to, to want to be in a position to win an NCAA championship. I mean, that's part of chasing the, the trophy, the dream for the 40 years. And, um, I had a chance, uh, uh, to go to Tennessee, uh, to work with Mike De Palmer senior and, uh, so I went uh, uh, and with the hope that in the next, you know, three to five years, he was, had told me he would retire and that uh, I would be in a position to be the head coach at, at the University of Tennessee, which I thought then would put me in a position to be able to win an NCAA championship. It just at Kansas, I mean, we were working ourselves. Uh, day and night and I mean we could qualify for the NCAA tournament be part of the top 16 teams but winning an actual NCAA championship at the University at Kansas was with only four indoor courts in the whole town mm -hmm. just didn't seem to me like it was it was really a realistic uh, uh, goal so uh, I went to I went to Tennessee and that very first year that I was there, Chris Woodruff won the NCAA uh, singles tournament and his parents came to me and asked me if I would uh, be his full-time coach on the tour. And, you know, obviously I'd never been out on the tour before, I'd never played on the tour, I'd never coached on the tour. <clears throat> and I said yes. And uh, I believe that was 1993. And he ended up going from unranked to 27 in the world. And, uh, we spent seven years together, which, uh, as both of you know, for mm -hmm. someone to coach somebody on the tour <laughs> for seven consecutive years is almost unheard of. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically players change coaches on the tour like uh, uh, people change, uh, like people change their underwear. I mean, mm -hmm. it just you know, guy loses to, uh, three weeks in a row, and it's the coach's fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. Uh, so his and my relationship uh, was special along with his parents. I mean, it was, it was like you said earlier, it was more, more old school. You know, they trusted me with their son. I trusted them. And, uh, and so we began to travel together and, and uh, he signed uh, after winning the NCA contract, he signed a, a very nice contract with, with, uh, uh, with Adidas, which, which allowed, him or gave him the funds uh, to put both of us on the road 
for a guarantee of three straight years. Mm. And <clears throat> at the time, I, I uh, uh, didn't didn't start. I mean, he struggled early on, uh, and so I went back and and traced the last ten NCAA champions, uh, including Chris and and before Chris, and what was their road to success. And how long did it take? And where was the breaking point? And what I found was you've got to be committed to stay out there for three years. When I traced back the 10 previous NCAA champions, year three was the breaking point. Either they, they got stuck in year three and started to drop, or in year three, they started to shoot forward. Mm. And it, that was exactly kind of, uh, what it was with Chris in, in year three, <clears throat> there was just one really significant event that I'm sure he would remember. And I remember vividly is we were over in France playing at that time. It was the satellite. You had to play, uh, you had to play three weeks to qualify for the masters mm-hmm. in the, in the fourth week. And Chris never liked, loved to travel internationally, especially, especially, he was uh, he was a, uh, an American kid through and through and through, and loved being in the United States, but didn't like uh, uh, you know just everything that a, a different country and different setup brought to the table. So we went over there, and he lost first round the first two weeks uh, of the Fran- of the French satellite, and he was uh, insistent that we go home. He didn't want to play the third week. Uh, uh, and I said that, no, I was, I didn't think that was the right move. And uh, his dad uh, called me, who was very influential with Chris and me and, and very involved in, in the tennis in a very, very good way and said, coach, this is your decision. And I said, we stay. And he won the third week and won the Masters uh, that next week. And from there, it, it put him in a position to get into the challengers and he just kept growing, growing from, from there. But again, a, a very critical moment in time. And for me, it wasn't about anything else except not quitting on something that you started. Mm. <laughs> again, it goes back to what I told you that I acquired from my parents. And so two weeks and we're going to quit because you lost first round and first round, not acceptable. That yeah. just philosophically did not sit well with me. And so that ended up being a, a very, very uh, critical moment in his development that, that, uh, that, that changed the directions uh, of things in, in uh, especially for, from a ranking standpoint for him so um seven years together i mean he had some wonderful wins beat a lot of the top players i mean remember when he beat agassi at uh in the french open uh the day they uh dedicated uh that that court to suzanne langland and mm-hmm. there was a big ceremony afterwards and uh uh he beat agassi and and I remember getting a call from Jose Higueras and Tom Gullickson at the time, obviously two very influential people in the American tennis world and invited me to the Nike party that night. They sent a limousine to get me and walk up <laughs> at three flights of steps into this open bar area that, <laughs> that uh, Nike, where Nike was having the party and they had 15 or 20 models in there, open <laughs> bar and food and everything else and and uh 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 at one point i end up back in the corner standing next to to john McEnroe, and we're talking about the match and i'm telling him how proud i was of chris and how i'd seen so many players uh get to the point with an agassi a sampras a courier where it was time to close the door and win and they weren't able to do it and how Again, happy I was for Chris that he was able to close the door on Agassi. And Mac looks at me and he says, ah, i got to be honest with you, it had nothing to do with Chris. <laughs> you know, and he just started to tell me how Agassi uh, was, was struggling and all the things about Agassi, 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 and mm-hmm. that Chris had nothing to do with it. And I remember going home that night pretty, pretty fairly demoralized. <laughs> <laughs> 
and you know, and obviously I know Matt didn't, you know, there was nothing personal or bad about it. It's just his observation or view of the thing. And in the end, uh, you know, obviously it's how you choose to look at something, but from Agassi's standpoint, he wasn't where he needed to be or he, in McEnroe's opinion, he wouldn't lose to somebody like, like Chris. And from my standpoint, it was a growth moment for Chris and something that again, helped accelerate him, helped accelerate him forward. But, you know, he ended up beating a lot of the top players. He was, he, and, and he was, uh, Jim Courier called Chris Woodruff uh, the fastest athlete uh, uh, in a, a Sports Illustrated article that he ever played against. So Chris had some very special characteristics, uh, one of which was um, an ability to p- perform under pressure. I saw it when he, early on uh, that year that I coached him in college. Woodruff was the type of guy that, that could hit winners under pressure on the big points. And you guys been around tennis your whole life. And there aren't many guys that have uh, that kind of ice in their veins Mm. to be able to come up with the goods (laughs) under pressure at key moments. And he was one of those guys and was also a great athlete and a hard, hard worker, uh, fantastic competitor. So, he was a good horse to ride. Uh, it's my first experience on the pro tour. And like I said, it was, there was a lot of growth that was necessary because I didn't really realize uh, the ins and outs of the tour. Uh, we had another key moment where I sat with Tom Gullickson, who was at that time the U.S. Davis Cup captain. And he told me that he thought Chris needed to get off of the challenger level and go and start playing qualifiers in the bigger tournaments. And up to that point, we had kind of philosophically gone with going to places where he could get in the main draw. Mm -hmm. So if he could get in the main draw of a challenger, that's where we were going versus going to play a qualifier of a a bigger event. Because playing qualifiers, as you know, you know, it goes on the weekend before the tournament starts. Well, if you don't qualify, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you don't have credentials you can't practice that week you can't get on the courts on and on and on it's not Mm -hmm. a great situation if you you don't qualify and so i sat with with gullickson gully who i like a lot who i still stay in contact with wonderful guy and he says you know i think chris needs to play in these qualifiers so that's what we did and uh he played four or five weeks of qualifying and did not qualify one time lost his confidence, really put put us in a in a tough spot and he had to go back and play a satellite to be able to get his confidence uh his confidence back. But uh and then, you know, from a learning standpoint for me, uh as a coach at the pro level, I philosophically we had been at the right point as to playing in the main draws and kind of changed that philosophy to play the qualifiers. And for I'm not saying right or wrong for some people it might have worked for chris it didn't uh so that was another moment in time where we we uh a lesson learned along the way and from that point on he just played main draws and again started to climb and 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 you know his uh his best moment was winning the the canadian open when it was a super nine uh he beat gustavo Quirton in the Mm -hmm. final uh fantastic moment uh very similar for me to to what happened saturday night as far as you know just uh moments that you'll cherish for a lifetime and a uh, very interesting thing happened after the match you know we're in the locker room and and uh when you are able to make it out to the finals of any tournament but especially a grand slam as you know <clears throat> excuse me, the locker room clears out. So there's only Chris and I in the locker room and the director of the tournament comes in. He's bringing one dignitary or VIP after another. Chris is shaking their hands, taking pictures. There are guys taking pictures of Chris and I. And the chef comes in and asks us what we want to eat and mm-hmm. uh, uh, makes us the meal, just what we wanted. And so we're in the locker room and the locker room attendant comes in and says to me that, 
that someone wants to see me outside and it's it's Querton's coach and uh, he's got a bottle of champagne and he starts shaking it up and pops a cork and <laughs> sprays champagne all over me. <laughs> and uh, I said, thank you, you know, what's up? And he said, the first time that Gustavo won a major event, the other coach had done the same thing to him hmm. and he wanted to pass that on to me. That's cool. Uh, which was very cool just a moment in time that I'll, I'll never forget. And, uh, yeah. So it, it, it was, uh, 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 the, the seven years on the tour, a lot of travel, uh, a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of grinding. Uh, but once you can get to that, the, 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 uh, the upper echelon, the top tier, and then Chris was, and we were able to make his own schedule and decide where you wanted to play and the weeks you wanted to play and all the major tournaments you, you could play. I, I mean, the lifestyle at that level is yeah, unbelievable from the standpoint you're picked up in limousines from the airport, you're staying in five-star hotels, you have tickets to any event that's in town that week. I mean, you're getting treated like an absolute king. But the grind to get there is nothing close to that mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean when you're at that lower level and, and satellites and even some challengers you, you know you're staying in places that aren't all that nice mm -hmm. and and uh eating meals at places that are as well are not all that nice so um those seven years were were quite interesting for me, and 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 seven very very enjoyable years. And now the irony of the whole thing is Chris is the head coach at the University of Tennessee, yeah. and we're competing against each other in the SEC. And uh, so I, I mean, things have come full, full circle that way. But yeah, he and I still talk. Yeah, I'm sorry, to interrupt. He was just a match away from playing University of Florida in the finals. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. We we played them twice this year. They beat us in the in the finals of the SEC. We beat them during the regular season at our place and then they beat us in the finals of the uh SEC tournament uh, a few weeks ago. So uh and they were in the semis and I it looked like we were gonna get that uh, the rubber match with them in the finals, but unfortunately they lost to Baylor in the semis and so it was Baylor we saw in the finals. Your experience so, with Chris, uh, I think I thought of you as just a natural motivator, Mr. Positive, pump people up. He, Pearl's got the juice. Uh, your time with Chris on the tour, that must be an added bonus for you to be able to communicate with all these players at the University of Florida. Have the, I'm sure they all have the goals yeah. of playing beyond college tennis. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's wonderful to have that, that, that knowledge and experience in the background because then you can speak intelligently to them about where the future is and what the future holds and 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 help them understand <clears throat> you know the grind that they're getting ready to get themselves into and what it's going to take in order to be successful and how long it's going to take in order to be successful and all the important things that you that you need to think about as you're going out to the tour and establish early on i mean one of the best things i think that happened with chris and myself is you know, we had a, a plan for his game right out of the gate. And he was unbelievable from the bat. Uh, the the forehand was big. Uh, the backhand was his best shot. The serve got better. But the slice and the volley weren't really a part of of, of his game. And Mike the Palmer Sr. Had, had brought him up and, the only time he wanted him to go to the net was to shake the other guy's hand. <laughs> and I remember vividly one day when I didn't think uh, uh, Mike Sr. was around, Chris and I were on the, on the, court, on the stadium court at the University of, of Tennessee, and I was feeding him volleys. And up for, above, I, I screamed, Mike the Palmer Sr., I don't want to see him at the net anymore. Get him on the baseline. That's where he's going to make a living at the baseline. And, you know, I turned, turned red because I didn't think he was around and we were, we were doing that. But, but with Chris, that's, we spent a lot of time those first three years 
working on his volley, working mm-hmm. on his slice. And I remember vividly he's in a position to to go to the finals of a of a of a challenger with a volley sitting right above the net and he dumps it into the net mm-hmm. and and cost him the match. Uh but my point being in year three when he was ready to break through, he could slice the ball and he could volley because he could open the court with the best of them. Mm. And it wasn't like he needed to be a great volleyer. He just needed to be able to come in and hit the volley to the open court to win the point. And he was able to do that. So in the end, the work that needed to be done in those three years when he was struggling with his game, the plan was there. So then when he gets into the top 100, the top 50, so a lot of times you see people, and, and, and you guys will know this, that have to take a step back or two steps back yeah. and say, I can't go from 90 to 10 because I don't have a slice or yeah. I can't volley. Yeah. Now they got to disappear and go learn to do that. The work was done kind of in those formative years with Chris, so he didn't have to take that that step back. So that's something I try to point out to a lot of these young guys that are going on the tour, you know, that, you you know, you really need to make sure that your game is complete and that there is a plan for those years, because uh, as you both know, on the tour, you got a lot of time on your hands, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, a lot of weeks where you're out of the tournament Monday, you're not going to play again until the next Monday. So, you know, what kind of work are you doing? And it's not just, playing sets or just being out there to practice. I mean, there needs to be a purpose and, and, and the purpose needs to be based on how can you grow your game? You know, you want to bring your weaknesses up to a higher level and make your strengths even stronger. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have an understanding of those two things and, and I mean, through my time with Vic, I, I, was able to help him with some of these things fundamentally to help take yeah. his game to another, another, another Mike, level. Like Mike DePommer Sr., he was actually a founder of the Nick Voluntary Tennis Academy. And, you know, hats Absolutely. off to Mike DePommer and Nick Voluntary, nothing negative, but Andy and I certainly with you, um, you really have to be an insider um, within the Vic Braden realm because. Vic was just looked upon as this great entertainer, the little short, fat, funny guy, yeah. as he would call Which himself. He was, he was a great entertainer. The fat Albert. So. Uh, because Vic was better known for really for his presentation than his information. Mm. And so it's, it's yeah, a lot of people to this day, and that's one thing we're trying to do through our podcast and through our Pathway curriculum is carry the torch uh, with what Braden put together. I was going to ask you, Scott, I mean, are you, I know with your Braden background, it's hard to not see things. Um, are you able to work on, you know, development, fundamental development with the players um, that you've experienced, obviously, in your whole college career, but also at Florida? Do you spend much time in, in stroke development or using video, things like that? Yeah, I mean, we use video a lot here. I mean, I think that's one of the things that sets us apart. I, I mean, uh, especially Coach Shelton and Coach Stump, uh, you know, all our matches are videotaped, and the mm-hmm. two of them, uh, more so than myself at this point, go back and look at the video, and uh, some from the stroke side, but more from the strategy side, and what the opponent is bringing to the table. So, our scouting reports are 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 done internally and whenever possible, and and makes a difference. As far as you know, I think my days at at, at Kansas. Uh, uh, and with Chris were more me calling the shots as mm-hmm. far as stroke production and, 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 and the teaching part. And now I'm kind of a little bit more on the peripheral. I mean, uh, Brian Shelton's a wonderful, got a wonderful, wonderful tennis mind and uh, 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 grew up learning from Bill Tim, who, who uh, uh, Steve knows uh, well. And, and so, yeah, I'm not as involved at, at that, I mean, when a guy is struggling and I'm working with him, with him one-on-one, you know, I'll, I'll revert back to more of my knowledge of the fundamentals to try things. But, you know, <clears throat> we believe in a lot of the same things. And, and uh, uh, 
but not everything. And he's not a Brayden guy uh, uh, from his his background. So uh, it's a little bit different role for me here. But like I said, I mean, to, to see something fundamentally, I, I mean, the eye is still there to see and, you know, the correction of what needs to be done as it is it is everything done the Braden way here? The answer is no. Uh, and then, you know, part of what I've had to, to learn over time, especially dealing with players that are somewhat developed when you get them, mm-hmm. is trying to work within the framework of what they have at the time right. and, 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 and not necessarily being in a position to change everything the way that I, I, I would. But if you're talking about my own son and <laughs> the development, or it, I'm not teaching young people that much anymore, but if I was to again, I would revert right back to everything I learned from Braden. I mean, it's just very comfortable for me to teach that way. I know it's I know it will be successful and I, I know it can, as Steve has proven, I know you can take you to the very top. <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 and the confidence that I got from my time with Braden about understanding fundamentals and, and knowing that I could correct a stroke or teach a stroke or, 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 you know, things of that nature is a confidence that has just allowed me really to get to where I am today <laughs> because, you know, you see so many people and you both know that, that, you know, guy used to play, he was a good player, had a lot of success. He doesn't know his, his head from a hole in the wall about teaching. <laughs> and so, you know, he's going to be out there hitting the ball, hitting the ball, trying to tell you to hit the ball like he does. Well, it, that's, you know, that's not the way to, to, to develop a, a young player as, as both of you know. So, uh, two different animals, uh, for sure. Uh, one, one thing, Pearl, me, um, sorry, go ahead for you. Yeah. For me, it, you know, that experience with Vic laid a foundation inside of me that, that, that built to a confidence <laughs> that I, I, even to this day, I, I, you know, I feel like I can make a contribution, uh, uh fundamentally almost to anybody's game that, that, that I see. So those years were invaluable for me uh, uh, as far as moving forward with my career. You mentioned Bill Tim. Uh, I always remember Bill's name it was always mentioned between Tony Traver in 59 and Michael Chain in 89. He was the American went the furthest in the French Open. So he's a player, but he was the voice of the USPTA. So for a decade, I was training people to pass the USPTA test. And you know, all his lectures, I mean, up in our library, we still have all sorts of audio tapes from Bill Tim, but he was in command, he was structured, he was principled. Uh, I can remember he had a, a three by five card system. So obviously there was nothing, no electronic <laughs> gadgets like there are today. And so he'd give a private lesson as a head coach because he was a college coach, but he's also a junior de- in junior development. So it used to be, where he would recommend that you take one lesson from the head pro, and then you take two practice lessons from the assistant pro. But he was systematic. He was organized. So, I mean, he was, uh, I think when it comes down to a Bill Tim and a Vic Braden, there are so many similarities, but yet Absolutely. Vic, when it yeah. comes down to, you know, just more science, more, more math, he had more, you know, than really anybody else on the planet, even if, if Vic was still with us today, he's still, unfortunately, to say that, he's still ahead of his time. Um, you know, I don't know if he spent much time on the on the, uh, the the internet. These all these gurus, we're trying to give out as much free tennis content as possible because Vic used to say uh, when the internet first came out, so much bad information is going out so fast. Mm-hmm. It's just incredible. Yep. Um, well, I tell you, the very interesting, you know, uh, uh, Brian Shelton, the coach here at Florida, and Bill Tim are very close even to this day. I mean, Coach Tim taught taught Brian a lot, and they traveled together on the tour. Uh, uh, um, but I had the good fortune to sit with, with Coach Tim a couple of years ago uh, when we played at Vanderbilt, and we're sitting in the stands after we practiced, and he starts talking to me 
and comparing the serve and volley to the forward pass in football. And <laughs> to hear him, how eloquently he compared those two things and, and to hear him talk is, uh, it's pretty special. He's a special guy. Uh, like you said, there's a lot of similarities to guys that have yeah. given their entire yeah. lives to the game of tennis that love it with a passion that's beyond passion. And so, I mean, later on now in my career to be able to have spent time around Coach Tim and obviously Coach Shelton teaches a lot of the things that, that, that he learned from Coach Tim. It's been another joy and another chance for growth for myself. And I'll, tell so, you, I'll tell you Bill Tim's story. So, I mean, prolific speaker. I think of someone like Jim Lair today, what a great speaker, but you know, he could definitely hold the room. So my son, Connor, you know, a lot of times I'd have a, a fellow coach take him to tournaments, but it was worked out where I took him to a, a Florida. It was called the designate at that time. And so if he did well, you'd play six matches. I don't remember if he won or lost, but he played six matches. So he, he was in the tournament for three days, two matches a day. So from there we head down. So we're from Tampa. I think it was in Stewart, Florida. Then we work our way down to Miami. So it's in the four teams and Connor gets through the qualifiers. So yeah, I think it's three matches he has to win. And then he actually wins the first round. And then he plays a kid from Brazil. You know, a big guy comes out and Connor get beat 6 0 6 0. So I said, Well, Connor, and this comes from Welby Van Horn. You have to respect your daddy, and your daddy's the person who just beat you. Mm-hmm. And I tell parents at local tournaments all the time when you're obviously you can't do it if it's a long distance tournament, you may have to catch a flight. Um, but you should stay and your son should just your daughter sit in the back and just watch the person who just beat you is, you know, your house is two hours away and you know, it's okay. You're going to get home a little later at night. So I told Connor, of course, we were just driving back to Tampa. He was going to sleep in the minivan and I was going to drive for the wee hours of the morning. So I said, we got to watch this kid from Brazil play his next match. So this little kid comes out and it was David versus Goliath. And this little kid is playing approach shots. He's coming to the net. He's just an all court player. So I said to a gentleman, older guy like myself, and there's just just a few people watching a 1400 match. It was at the University of Miami. And I said, you know, I've been watching tennis for the last seven or eight days. I guess it might've been four or five days. Well, it, it was a long time. And I said, this is the first kid I've seen who can really play. And I said, you know who he is? And he, he gave me his name. I should be able to just tell you his name. I w- you'll be able to tell me who it is. So then um, I said, where is he? Is he American? Where is he from? He goes, oh, he's from Tennessee. I said, oh, Bill Tim coaches him. And he said, how do you know that? <laughs> I said, well, there's only a few people in America who can teach like that. And, <laughs> and uh, he goes, so then he started asking me some questions. And I said, well, who are you? He goes, well, I'm the kid's father. <laughs> he, he actually had a brother played at Florida. I think he's a coach now at Tennessee. He did really well. He got the finals at Kalamazoo. Who's that guy? Coach by Bill Tim. You with me? <laughs> who is it? Who's the junior? Who is? Yeah, I'm with you. Who is it? No, I'm telling you. You, you should be able to tell me. He's got a, his Ryan's brother, Ryan, maybe. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. It's that's that's the Palmer. Are you talking? Uh, uh, are you talking? No, um, I guess the name just escapes me. But he, I believe the the um, at Vanderbilt at Vanderbilt. He's the assistant coach at Vanderbilt. Oh, that's Ryan Lippman. There you go. There's two Lippmans. Ryan Lippman. Ryan Lippman and yeah. his brother. But yeah, it was. Uh, right. His brother Max played for us. Yeah. Here. So it was Ryan, it was Ryan, Ryan yeah. Lippman. And so yeah. I'm telling Connor, I said, you know, see, you can go to the net. I don't care how big the other guy is. You got to go forward. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a guy who, you know, like the underspin backhand approach, I always tell tennis crowds tennis groups, you know, Naratilova and Wimbledon nine times, mm. get a tennis group together. It's hard to name nine people that, that since she retired, that can hit that shot. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, uh, but no, I have a tremendous respect for Bill Tim. Uh, Pearl with, um, I wrote down a few names here. Uh, Danny Manning, Steve Young was working for you. He was one of our students in your camp. People had hit balls before breakfast. So Young came back to us and, he was with us for five years, but he spent summers with you and he came back and he said he couldn't figure it out because he had balls of the 
the only, only light in the gym was the exit light, but it had a key to the gym and had to get the, the balls out in the dark. And somebody was in there shooting baskets. It was Danny Manning. I wrote down, uh, Andy's wife is from Dusseldorf. So we have a kid just as long before I met Andy's wife. But I used to take people to, uh, from Tampa to Gainesville to watch college tennis. And I think college kids, junior players really need to do that. So I tell this kid from Dusseldorf, he said, I'm going to, Told your mom, I'll take you to Florida just so you can see, experience college tennis. So we went to one of your practices and you and Coach Shelton, uh, obviously the, the rules and regulations, we had to be off in the distance. So, but I told this kid, we're going to go to this college. I had to downplay a little. We're going to go to this college and they're going to have a stadium bigger than any stadium in Dusseldorf. <laughs> the kid starts arguing with me. <laughs> so we ended up in Gator Stadium walking around. But my question is, is like someone like Larry Brown, but someone called me up one time, the great basketball coach who won the NCAA championship at Kansas. Someone calls me up, hey, Smith, uh, turn the ESP on, Pearl's in the huddle. <laughs> but my question is, or just to share with people, you've been around so many uh, players and coaches from other sports. Mm. Um, just make a few comments on that, if you would. Yeah, huge influence on me. You know, I, I've kind of been a gym rat my whole life and, and, I really, uh, as you, you would say, like being in the locker room. But, you know, so that's in the 80s when uh, I was at Kansas and uh, Larry Brown shows up and, and then uh, Danny Manning shows up. And and then Danny Manning's father was the, was the assistant coach. At, and so I got to know the Manning family uh, reasonably well and, and watched Danny progress and, uh, you know, his, I'll never forget when in '88 when they won the national championship at Kansas. The <clears throat> the headline on the Sports Illustrated, uh, our, our or the, the cover of Sports Illustrated was a picture of Danny, and it, it said uh, Danny and the Miracles, and uh, it was you know he was surrounded by four guys that probably no one has heard of then or heard of since. But uh, as far as playing is concerned, so he was a one man show per se. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> it was it was obviously fantastic to watch him and, and, and his development. But I learned so much from Larry Brown. It is just it was just it was a moment in time for me or a period of time where, you know, <clears throat> it's two Jewish guys coaching head coaches in, at Kansas and mm -hmm. he took me under his wing and, and uh, I, I, I mean the, the, the guy the guy's the only coach in the history that's won an NCAA championship and an NBA ch championship and the NBA championship happened to be with the Pistons when I was living back in Michigan and so I would drive up to the palace to watch practice mm -hmm. once or twice a week it was over two hour drive. I'd get up at, 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 at early in the morning and leave by seven thirty, and be up there by nine forty five. He'd let me sit in on the coaches' meetings and 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 everything. It was mm -hmm. a, a, a wonderful experience. But the time you're talking about in the huddle was I went. I was in Chicago to recruit Pat Hahn, uh, who was from Woodstock, and uh, Larry at that time was with the San Antonio Spurs and they were playing the Chicago Bulls mm -hmm. that night. And so uh, Larry had invited me to stay at the hotel with him and go to the game. And I finished recruiting, drove downtown and I was running. It was, it was tight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got out of the car and literally got on the bus and went to the game. And, uh, uh, that night, I mean, Jordan was play Michael Jordan was playing for the Bulls, and and you can nobody can sit on the bench in in a professional basketball game. That's not allowed. But there's two seats right behind the head coach, mm -hmm. and there's a security guy there, and the second seat was open. And Larry said, you know, he called me used to call me Scotty Boy. Scotty Boy, you sit next to the security guy. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, coach, whatever you say. Mm -hmm. Game gets tight, comes down to the very end, the last uh, last time out, and, and Larry is, is de uh, designing the play he wants to run. 
and you know in the pros, especially pro basketball, I mean, you see these timeouts. A lot of times the players are looking around. They're hardly paying attention. They're, yeah, they, 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 yeah, 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 you know, that, that type of thing. Well, I'm sitting right behind the, the, where the guys are sitting, and I got my head, <laughs> yeah, you know, poked almost into the huddle, and, and I'm listening to every word. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the end of the game. He's designing the, 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 last, the last play. And so uh, they, end up, they end up winning the game, and we go back to the hotel, and the assistant coaches and myself and Larry are all up in the restaurant having a bite to eat. And Larry starts telling the story that, you know, the last time out, he's designing the play, and he's looking at the guys, and all of a sudden he looks up, and there's Scotty Boy Faith right in the huddle. <laughs> Listen to every word I, ha- I had to say. And, and, and not only that experience, but to watch Michael Jordan up close, mm. uh, to be courtside like that when he was in his, his prime, and to watch the athleticism that he brought to the table was borderline mind-boggling to me that, that, that night. Probably hear a little and, trash talk, too. Oh, you heard everything, yeah. and and, and uh, David Robinson was on the team at mm. the time, and, and, and so yeah. I, I, to overall, talk about your question. Uh, I, I've been exposed to some wonderful coaches in other sports that have had a huge, huge influence on me, and and uh, you know, coaching is coaching in a lot of ways, and to see how different people approach it in different mm. sports has always. And some of my best friends are coaches uh, from other sports as, as life has, has gone on. So um, basketball was always my favorite sport. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, I wish in some ways that maybe I had been able to coach basketball and gone in that direction. But uh, I remember somebody telling me when I was young, you know, it's a, you need to do you need to do things that you know <laughs> when you know something and, and you have a, uh, your gifts are in that area to try to do something that you don't know or try to get into a different area. So I've always stuck with tennis, obviously loved it. It's been, tennis has been so, so good to me. It's, it's crazy, but yeah, other sports, other coaches, uh, t- ton of places to learn from me. And Larry Brown is one of those people that I look back on. That was a, a huge, huge, influence on me in, in so many positive ways and just to catch up on that it was yeah. just uh several months ago my son is now working with the uh, athletic department in unc charlotte and larry lives part-time in charlotte and we still stay in touch and sammy my son and i were able to have lunch with larry uh, uh a couple months ago and we laughed and told stories but mm. and now my son sammy and he have 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 a relationship so it, it, it's yeah he he's he's a very very special guy to me and, and and someone that's been that like i said took me under his wing uh for whatever reason uh, uh but it was it, it's special to me and he's a very special guy to me so let yeah me, let uh, me backtrack on a couple of things pro um i take a few notes because uh senior moments but actually to go back to ryan Lippman, he beats the kid from brazil also go back to the kid from Germany. We take him up and he says there's no, no way uh, college has a, a bigger stadium than the city of Dusseldorf. But the NCAA rules, he was not in high school. So actually we got a chance to, I remember now thinking back, we got to go to the gym with you in the, in the men's team. And Billy Donovan was in the gym with his yeah. team. And I, yeah. told the, I told the kid from Germany, I said, hey, tomorrow night we'll be back in Tampa and you'll be able to watch these guys play on ESPN. <laughs> Tell us about Billy Donovan. What was he like? Oh, he was, you know, Billy, I, I came in here more towards the end of Billy's run, uh, uh, but there was a very interesting story about how Billy and I first connected was, uh, you know, I, I, as you know, I like to work out. I, I try to work out almost every day, five, six, seven days a week. But <clears throat> so there's, there's uh, uh, an elliptical machine in, in the basketball building and uh, you know the basketball had its own, had at florida has its own separate practice facility versus uh the o'connell center where they play their where they actually play their games so <clears throat> i go in and I'm, i get on the elliptical and 
guy that's the head strength coach comes to me and says, you know, you probably should only try to come in here to work out like between noon and one. That's really the best time. And, uh, you know, Billy likes to work out on the elliptical and I just, you know, whenever he comes in, it needs to be available to him. So <clears throat> I'm in there working out one day and I'm on the elliptical. Billy comes in and I immediately offer to get off the machine. And he says, Oh no, no, no. Coach, coach, you're fine. Billy, listen, I, well, as it turns out, the athletic director had bought that elliptical for Billy after he won the first national championship. I did not know that at the time, but that's how the elliptical got into the, into the, into the weight room. And I told Billy that Preston Green, the head strength coach, had told me I shouldn't be on the elliptical if Billy <laughs> wanted to use it. And Billy looks at me, he says, Coach, you get on that elliptical anytime you want to. And if I come in and want to work out, I'll use another machine. It's all going to be fine. You <laughs> use that. And so he, he was a wonderful guy. Everybody loved him here. He made, he, I mean, Florida is not a basketball school. Florida is a football school. <laughs> and as you guys know, you can go around the country. I'd give you a name of a college. You'll tell me that's a football school or that's a basketball school. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's just the way it is, whether it's right or wrong. Kansas, the basketball school. <laughs> Florida, yeah. football school. You know, Michigan, football school. Ohio State, football. You know, mm -hmm. that, How about that, that yeah, Pearl, Kentucky? Uh, famous story in college sports is Bear Bryant. He's a coach at Kentucky. They go to a banquet. Adolf Rupp is there. He gets a Cadillac, and Bear Bryant gets a cigarette lighter. He went home to his yeah. wife. Went home to his wife that night and said, "We're leaving Kentucky. It's a basketball school. Yeah, we got to yeah. go to a football yeah. school." Um, yeah, that's where, but, but, but what Billy did here in basketball to win back-to-back -back national championships was uh, a feat that you know may never be accomplished again here, and so. He's another one of those guys, just a special guy. Uh, unbelievable. You know, Billy, Billy had some things about him, like at the gymnasium had to be clean all the time. He didn't go in there as a player, like uh, at night and start shooting balls and leave five balls sitting on the court. Mm -hmm. That was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, and he had, you know, he had a discipline to himself and the guy himself was a phenomenal athlete. And I had remembered him as being at Prom Providence with Patino as a short guy with an unbelievable shot. I, I watched him, you know, as a player and, and to be able to, to see it. And uh, along the same line, to be exposed to Pat Summit, <laughs> the uh, great women's college basketball coach, when I was at Tennessee, another experience I'll never forget. I mean, spending time with her and listening to her talk, listening to her, her her talk about how she built the program and the culture. I mean, things uh, yeah, that just get me. I think tennis Look. tennis players. I mean, certainly everybody's got to take your high. You know, players who want to get to the uh, University of Florida, a Power Five tennis team. Wow, what a challenge! They just they have so much time on the phone. You find out what their screen time is. If they could read about someone like Pat Summit, they could even YouTube someone like Pat Summit. I was at a challenger. Uh, with Austin Krychek and the people that were t our our hosts, I asked, and that time Pat's health wasn't very good. It was a few years before she passed away. And and they said, no, we're really good friends with Pat. And the next day, I'm, I'm out to dinner with the women's basketball <laughs> coach. I think that, like, say the NFL, that my brother who was in pro hockey, he used to send his coach, an NHL coach, a head coach, or maybe two or three coaches to – go spend time with it. his connection was with the New York giants. But I think that tennis, uh, tennis kids don't spend enough time around other athletes. Um, another one is Neil Anderson, Andy Brandy, who I have a connection with. He sent Neil to me and we have this 25 hour course. He watches it three times. He comes back a second time to be filmed. And he looks at me and he says, I love your system. Of course, it's really not my system. This is a system of systems, and Braden really the cornerstone of that system. Because I love your system, but it's not going to work. I, I, I just laughed. I said, "I know." And then he said, "Yeah, because it's too much work." Mm -hmm. But he had that yeah. he had that NFL mentality, where he you know he was doing all the routines, and then um, I know that shortly afterwards he had some problems with his knees and took up golf. 
you probably know him, right? Yeah, he's very good friends with Brian Scout and our, our head coach here. They live in the same neighborhood out here in in Gainesville, and and uh, uh, I've met him se- uh, several times, but not as close with him uh, as, as as Brian is. But Brian just tells me story after story about how Neil becomes obsessed with learning tennis, learning golf, learning billiard, whatever it is. He's gonna go to level twenty five. To mm-hmm. try to figure out the fundamentals, to try to get good at it. He's been doing this his, his whole life. So, you know, he played in the shadow of Walter Payton back in those days uh, mm-hmm. with the Bears. Yeah, so, he played eight. Uh, he was in the backfield for eight years with the Bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great athlete, uh, uh, still a legend here in in in, in town. So, uh, um, so that kind of brings us up to the Florida days. Uh, you know, I, I showed up here nine years ago when uh, Brian Shelton got the job uh, to be his volunteer, and and uh, you know we built this thing for kind of from the bottom up, which has been uh, exciting. I mean, I was telling somebody just the other day. I mean, for me, looking back on a, obviously fifty years in tennis, I I I enjoy the process of building a program. Uh, more so probably than I do the process of maintaining a program. And mm-hmm. so uh, uh, coming here with Brian, he is, uh, his dad is from the military, was in the military. And so he's got a military type mentality about how you work and how you organize. And I mean, I've watched him for, uh, for nine straight years and we have a plan every single day for practice. Uh, there's nothing happens by chance here. Uh, uh, so, uh, the athletic director that hired him nicknamed him the tortoise (laughs) because he just keeps, he's slow and steady Mm -hmm. and slow and steady, as you know, over time, uh, at least here won the race. And so with this team, uh, this year, especially there's three things that we've been saying to these guys. Uh, uh, obviously with COVID and everything else that's, that's going on, there's been a, a lot of tricky situations, especially with young people. But the three things that we, we've, we've said to these guys, one, be thankful. Two, be humble. Three, be hungry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we kept repeating those things to them over and over again. And it's, it's been fantastic for us. And I think in a, in a, in a nutshell, it kind of captures what we're looking for and what we're trying to to teach young people. I mean, just be thankful. Be thankful for your parents. Be thankful for the opportunities. Be thankful to be able to play in a place like the University of Florida. Be able to be surrounded by other great athletes in other sports, et cetera, et cetera. And be humble. Come on, man. It's so important mm. <laughs> that, that we all be humble in, in life. I mean, it's a life lesson, not just a tennis lesson. Be humble. It, it just, it, 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 it's just a characteristic that is so impressive. Uh, yeah, I, Amir I Delic. Uh, Amir yeah. Delic was our first, first assistant here for a year. The guy is a, a tremendously accomplished tennis player. You guys know him. Yeah. He played in Illinois, played on, on the tour. You could spend two hours with Amir and you would never know he played tennis. <laughs> he would never mention it. <laughs> he would never talk about himself. The guy was the most humble human being or one of them I've ever been, been around. Mm. So trying to help these guys understand how important humility is and then the be hungry part is, uh, uh, you know, a hungry dog hunts best. <laughs> yeah. There's no other way to get around, around it. So, so, uh, you're a mere delic. Uh, let me just add this mere delic. You played with Tylee. I used to go up there first with Jennifer Roberts and then with Tylee at one time, it was both of them at the university of Illinois and, uh, within the rules and the rules were ever changing, doing something for the team. And, uh, I remember getting a thank you note from Amir Delic. Um, yeah. yeah. With amazing, Special amazing guy. guy. But, amazing guy. Um, Pearl, with, uh, I know we're winding down here. One question I wanted to ask is, you got 10 guys on your team. I know, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, one, one player was not playing the doubles. Um, but 
how do you keep going with the bottom guys? I mean, if you were to take your bottom four guys, you could play another team, forfeit two points, and still win 4-2. Mm-hmm. Don't you have a guy in your team, uh, coached by Brian Smith, Lucas, is it Greff or Grief? Yeah, Lu- Lu- Lucas Greif is yeah. on our team. I mean, he won a Kalamazoo, he, he won a Kalamazoo yeah. title. I mean, he's not, he was not in the lineup, right? Yeah. Lucas, I mean, is, uh, Lucas is a phenomenal person. Uh, we, we just... <clears throat> yeah, he's a he's the Kalamazoo champion, uh, 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 outstanding player, outstanding person. Uh, for most part, he sat in the seven hole uh, this year. Uh, uh, the guy that was playing in front of him, six uh, five lefty from England, Josh Gujer, who didn't lose a dual match for us once we put him at the six hole. Mm-hmm. I think he won twenty, twenty one, twenty two matches in, in a row, which just kind of did not allow Lucas a, a, a chance to get back in the lineup. Uh, we had a, a little discipline problem with Blake, Blake Bicknell in the round of 60 to 4 and 32, and he was not allowed to play that weekend, and Lucas stepped in and, and performed like a champion. Uh, but Lucas is a ball player, and just one of those things. He made a decision, and... and uh, um, and he didn't play much, so he's sitting in the seven hole for us. And then in the eighth hole is uh, is a guy that just played doubles for us, Johannes Engelson, who's won over a hundred singles and a hundred doubles matches for the Gators. So wow. <clears throat> this is where we get down to the culture and why this team was so special in so many ways and was able to win a championship. Lucas Greif had a ton of reasons that he could have complained. He could have torn this team apart in so many ways just by being the guy in the locker room saying to others and, and splitting the group in half, I should be playing instead of this guy. This guy showed so much dignity, so much class. He came to practice every single day trying to make himself better and everybody else around him better. He has not complained one single time to any of us or anybody through, through this process. You don't win championships unless you have the fabric of your program are kids like, like Lucas Grice. This kid is very, very special to me. And obviously having gone to Ball State and him coming from Indiana and Brian Smith also went to Ball State. He and I have a, a wonderful relationship and have been very close. And this guy is, and the other thing that I feel is he wants to stay here at Florida and this guy is going to be a player for us here. He's, he practices and takes sets off of the guys all in front of him with, with regularity. But again, it gets back to the fabric of, of what you're building. And like I said, you don't, a guy like Lucas Grice, a guy like Johannes Ingleson, two guys that could play anywhere in the country are sitting in the seven and eight hole. Uh, if that's not managed properly, if they don't have the right character, if they don't have the right personality, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're yeah. in trouble. And you see it in a lot of the other programs that are deep. You know, guys aren't playing. Parents are calling. They're unhappy. They're tearing the team apart. Four guys believe they should get play. Other four guys think they should, you know, and it because, you know, you end up spending more time having to manage and worry about that than you do things that you should be able to, to focus on. So, mm. uh, uh, I think we've done a pretty good job, but that goes down to the character of each one of these guys. And in recruiting, uh, with Coach Shelton and Coach Stumper, character is important to us. And if we don't get the, we've avoided a lot of these 50 year guys that are available now. You know, you can transfer mm-hmm. into a different school and just play one year. We, we, we haven't touched a single one of those guys because, you know, we don't want to upset. Uh, the, the 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 culture and what what we built here and maybe mm-hmm. take an opportunity away. We're taking a fifth year guy next year for the first time, a kid from the University of Michigan by the name of Matthias Seymour, who is a phenomenal kid. This kid is just so special, it's unreal. But he's an exception to our, our fifth year, and, and not that there can't be an exception. But his he's got impeccable character. Uh, lefty, we're going to have five or six lefties on our team next year, which we've never had, never been in a 
in a team or a program that has this. But he's a, another lefty that's coming to us uh, uh, again. We just decided that he was just too good of a kid uh, uh, to to pass on. So Pearl, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I get to wind down here. I know you got to go sure. with. Uh, can you make a few comments on uh, you know Brian Shelton? I know his wife uh, is from a tennis family. Emma and Ben, I mean, obviously you've been there long enough, so they were probably in elementary school when you got there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw Emma. When we got here nine years ago, uh, uh, Emma and Ben were, were, were young kids, so I've, I've watched them both de- develop. Uh, oh, well, when, when Brian got the job here, you know, he'd been at Georgia Tech, won the first national championship that Georgia Tech had, had ever won with their women's tennis team. And then uh, took the job on the men's side here, which doesn't happen very often in, in college tennis, period. Uh, uh, and so he's the only human being. He's the only human being that's won a national championship on the women's side and on the men's side in college tennis. He's the only African-American ever to win a championship on either side. Uh, uh, so he... He's very, very accomplished at at, at, the, at at this level. And when he came to see me uh, when I was in Chapel Hill as a volunteer there, and and we talked, he didn't want somebody to come work with him. He wanted a partner in this whole thing. I remember it very vividly, our conversation. And uh, and so, I mean, he's very, very close to our son Sammy and my wife Cindy. And I've become very close with Ben and Emma and his wife, Lisa, and uh, Ben, who's on our team now, who clinched the fourth point Saturday night, which made the whole evening almost like a fairy, fairy tale. Played football and baseball when I first got here as a mm-hmm. youngster, and he told me he'd never play tennis. He was not going to follow in Dad's footsteps. It just wasn't going to happen. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, along the way, he decided uh, he wanted to be a tennis player and, you know, Benny Shout is 6'2", 192 pounds, <laughs> lefty that hits the serve at 132 off the clock. Yeah. Benny should be graduating from high school next week. <laughs> he came out a year early. The guy that clinched the NCAA championship for the Gators should be a senior in high school. It's an absolutely phenomenal story. He's got his, low ties, his, too. <laughs> his, his daughter, Emma who also plays uh, played uh, three and four for South Carolina for the last last couple of years. I call Emma the total package. I've been telling her that since she was a little girl. She's absolutely gorgeous. She's never gotten a B in high school or college. She works day and night. She's got a wonderful personality. Uh, 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 so the, the, the two kids, I've watched them grow up and and – have been very uh, spent a lot of time with both of them. It's a wonderful family. The relationship that that both our families have together, and that 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 coach and I have together, just it's unbelievable. I I tell a couple quick little stories that I don't share very often, or have shared a little bit more recently. But when we first got here, uh, we had a we had to change our living trust and. We had to make a decision as to what we would do with our son, Sammy, who obviously is the prize in our family. If something happened to Cindy and I simultaneously, we were killed in a car accident or a plane wreck or whatever. And so uh, we went to Sammy and he said that uh, if something like that happened. He'd like to, to live with the Sheltons. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went to coach and we sat and I had to ask him whether they would take Sammy into his family mm-hmm. if something happened to my wife and I and uh, came back the next day and said, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that was a turning point in our relationship because even though it was early on, when you know that somebody is willing to do that for you, it yeah. just, you know, words can't hardly express uh, uh, how, how that made Cindy and I feel. So, and yeah. Sammy. So it, it just, uh, and I got uh, uh, I got a note from Franklin Sachs. I don't know if you know Franklin or not, uh, Smitty, no, but he's up in Chicago. He's been in tennis his, his whole whole life, and he's telling me they should do a documentary 
uh, sell them myself, and it should be called Fire and Ice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it's yeah, I mean he's not, it's like I keep telling uh, uh, Coach Shelton. A guy my age should not be ha- be having this much fun <laughs> because it's just it's enjoyable. The two guys I work with, uh, uh, Brian and, and Tanner Stump, and we've got a wonderful group of guys. And you know, the University of Florida to work in their athletic department is is something just that you can't ask for anything more. You're given every opportunity to succeed. Mm-hmm. The previous athletic director who hired Brian. Guy's name is Jeremy Foley, who did a phenomenal job of building this whole athletic department into a dynasty. The first time I heard him speak, I was beside myself because he got up in front of a crowd of two or 300 people and said, trying hard and losing at Florida is not acceptable. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I never heard an athletic director get up and say, Say that. Uh, say that know, again. What did he say? He said, "Trying hard and losing at Florida is not acceptable." <laughs> so I don't want to hear that you know, went out, you gave your best effort, and you lost. <laughs> that's not that's not acceptable. I remember and you so, t- I remember you telling me one time I was up there to visit, and the lowest ranked program on campus was twenty one in the country. Hmm. I mean, we were 16 in the country, 15 or 16. And we were the lowest ranked spring sport that for the first four or five years. Mm-hmm. Somebody called the local paper, said, why don't you c- cover men's tennis? They said men's tennis doesn't move the needle in our department. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I mean, we're not going to – men's tennis has never done any, anything here. So, But the comment he made, what I have come came to realize very quickly, is he raised the bar here. He raised the bar, mm. and now everybody has reached for that bar, <laughs> and so it that was the leadership you had at, at the top for years. And our current athletic director Scott Strickland has maintained it, and so that makes Florida very different to me. Uh, uh, that most of the time, you hear an athletic director speak, you, you know, give it your best shot, do the best you can. You know, fight for the colors, fight for the school, and everything will be all f- fine. Make sure your guys go to classes. Mm. Trying hard and losing at Florida is not is unacceptable. <laughs> and and uh, 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 the the other model of, of at Florida is a championship experience with integrity. Mm. How good is that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I mean. The, 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 the pieces are in the right place here at the University of Florida. So, I mean, it's really a privilege to be able to coach here and for this to be my last stop has been absolutely phenomenal for me. And I've enjoyed every single day of it. And again, yeah. helping build the program and then seeing the success we had on Saturday night. First time in the history of Florida athletics that they've won a championship in men's tennis. So, like I told those guys that night when we talked, you can go through a lifetime of, of, of living and, and never be able to do something for the first time uh, ever. And we were able to do that Saturday night. So no, for you. Uh, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if it's, it's totally set, set in yet, but I, I, I know it's, uh, there's a lot of joy in my heart having been a small part of that. That's awesome. Well, it's fantastic. I really was so grateful to be there. I know you're 40 years in tennis. I mean, 40 years is, that I've known you in tennis and you're 50 years in tennis. Uh, so much fun. It's been so much fun to have you on the podcast. Yeah. Anything else, Andy? No, I think, I think it's been awesome having you on. I, I, you know, wanted to ask you for advice for juniors and things like that, but I think you already said it where it was, you know, be thankful, be humble and be hungry. Those three words would be great advice for doesn't, the yeah, juniors. Listening doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, uh, you guys are making a difference, and, and for for that, you deserve a lot of credit. And uh, uh, thanks for asking me to be on, and totally enjoyed this time. It went very fast, and uh, you guys uh, keep up the good work. Oh, thanks, guys. All right, Perel. All the best to yep. your family. 
and uh, Thanks, buddy. and what you yeah. do. It's all great. Thank you Thanks. so much. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. See you, Scott. Well, it was a great episode. A lot of a lot of pearls by by the pearl from the pearl. Yeah, I would love to have a second follow up with the pearl and just tell stories. stories I mean, yeah, that guy is so funny. Uh, you know what an experience to be able to hang around. You know the high level of basketball as well. All the different experiences, but I'm sure the the coaching aspect. You know, even the the you know the bench, those kind of things that you talk about a lot. You know, it's got to be helpful to any tennis coach. You know, it's a, just a different type of culture. Oh, I mean college tennis. I mean culture's know. culture, but but just you know with the bench and those kind of things is just a little different than normal yeah. tennis stuff. Being part of a team. Um, you know, the, yeah. so many of our students have had the chance to chances uh, to play Wimbledon and play the other Grand Slams. But it's amazing that kids that have experienced college tennis, mm. you, you just hear them time after time. It's almost like every person will say, "Greatest years of their life." Yeah. But, I mean, that was a movie script. Uh, Coach Shelton, his son, closing it out. Um, it, was, it was a Florida crowd too. It was in Florida. Sure. And yeah. It was just, um, yeah, it was just fantastic to be there. And yeah, I love the Pearl. Um, go way back with the Pearl, but that was great. Yeah. I mean, and also just last thing I'll say, I mean, you talk about this all the time where you, you know, you say the forehands and backhands, you know, it's the easy part. It's all about the character and just hearing what they do, you know, with the recruiting trip, how, okay, let's see how this kid treats his parents. Yeah. You know, it's like, you just get the right people there. And then the forehands, the backhands, things like that. Or no, I mean, I've been fortunate over the years where people will get on an airplane to come and work on technique. Mm -hmm. But I always tell them it's it's not about technique; it's yeah. about character. If yeah, you can get the character right, you can get the technique right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, all right, everybody. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that episode. I can't see how you wouldn't have. It was definitely one of my favorite. Listening to the Pearl and uh, get to know him a little bit. Scotty from Star Trek. Scotty, Scotty, Scotty. The Pearl, there used to be an NBA player, but the Pearl, the Pearl is, it's the Pearl. You want to have pearls. <laughs> the Pearl of wisdom. Yeah. But it, I, I think now I hear people calling him Coach P. Mm. That, yeah, that's, I think that's what he goes, that's what, that, not what he goes by, but his players are yeah. love, love and cope, Coach P. Coach P. It's great. Find us online, greatbasetennis.com, social media at greatbasetennis. Give us a rating when you get a chance on Apple. And until the next time, we're signing off. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.